How are you? Later, anytime, you yeah, know, well, email or, or whatever. I don't have your email, but I'm, can you get your phone? Yes, I'll yes, take you up, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank Hello, you. how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi. Okay. Yes, thank you so much. I don't know. Has it started yet? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. <laughs> Well, thank you for letting us do this. No, I, and I'm, I'm happy to have you here. Right here? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 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 Um, when it comes to black women's health, which I think is a very important, always the things that are important topics because as we know, the black women, we're the matriarch of the family yeah. and our health is that doing well. Oh yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's really important. So there was all your headphones okay. and let me make sure that the mic is close to you. Okay. How much time is left? One minute, okay. The mic itself? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. This is Empower Hour on 89.3 FM WPSW. I'm Deshaun Spencer, your host. So today we're dedicating our show to Black Women's Health, and I'm really excited that my guest is here in the studio with me. The Black Women's Health Imperative in the studio is Linda Blount. She is the president and CEO of the organization. Welcome to the studio. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. I'm so happy that you're here. If you have any personal comments, you can call 202-588-0893. So, I'm very familiar with the organization, but for those who are listening that have never heard of the organization before, if you could talk a little bit about your mission. Okay, be happy to. Um, one of the things that's really exciting is that um, we are focused entirely on the health and wellness of the nation's 21 million black women and girls, and in mm -hmm. fact, we're the only national organization with that focus. And so what we do is we spend time with research and policy and advocacy and turning what we learn about health and wellness into programs and messages that help women every day um, live their healthiest lives. So we're focused on a broad wellness, um, emotional, physical, and financial. So we have programs that help women avoid diabetes and chronic disease mortality to lower their weight, to improve healthy habits, to de-stress, mm -hmm. to get control of their financial lives, but also prevent HIV to get access to health insurance and understand what that means for their health and the, fam and the family's health. And um, we also work with researchers to make sure that our issues are on the agenda of, of major funders across the country. Wow, a lot, a lot of good work you guys are doing. So a lot, a lot of mouthful there. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we're talking about offline and the importance of preserving black women's health because we are the matriarch of the family, and it's not only about our health. If we're not healthy, then our husband's going to be healthy. Our children are healthy, right? That's right. That's right. If the mom's not healthy, nobody's healthy because we make the decisions in the family about health and wellness, and our families rely on us, and so we have to be as healthy as we can. Right, and unfortunately, a lot of us, we tend to focus on everyone else. You go to the doctor, you make sure someone else... I'm, I'm so guilty. I make sure my husband goes to the doctor. I'm thinking, hmm, when have I been to the doctor last? That's right. We, uh, we take care of everybody else. Um, 
And part of our challenge and, and the message that the imperative has for women every day is to take care of yourself. We began as a self-care organization mm -hmm. almost 33 years ago. Um, wow. On Spelman campus, as a matter of fact, where 2,000 women came together and said, we're gonna take care of ourselves because our health is just that important. So we've been committed to making sure women have the tools and resources and are empowered to take care of themselves. You know, we talk about on an airplane, put your oxygen mask on right, first. Right. We have got to take care of ourselves because if we don't, then whole communities can suffer. We're mm -hmm. just that important. Yes, I, I totally, totally agree. In the first segment, we were talking about Eden Fibroids. I know your organization does a lot of work when it comes to reproductive and mm -hmm. sexual health education. Can you talk a little bit about what you do there? Sure. Um, a major f policy focus for us is in reproductive justice. Mm -hmm. And for your listeners, they, they may know, but if you're looking at gender issues and um, income inequality, racism issues, these things all intersect when, when it comes to health access, particularly around contraception care and even abortion care. And reproductive justice simply says a woman has a right to have a child or not have a child and to take care of her reproductive health the best way she can. And so we make sure that women know what they can do, know what their rights are, and that we advocate for policies and legislation that support those rights and empower women to act on them. Yeah, it's very, very important. I think we should have the choice, but you know, it's my opinion, people can have their own. But you know, we also do My Sister's Keeper program too, which I think is a very important program. You can talk a little bit about that. Sure. It's really exciting. My Sister's Keeper is our way of bringing the issues of reproductive justice down to the college campus mm -hmm. and women ages 18 to 34. Because so often, they don't know what their rights are. They don't know how policies actually affect their overall health or their sexual health. So what we're doing is we're building chapters on college campuses. We've been on Spelman's campus and Howard's campus and a few others to make sure that women understand and have the tools to advocate, to understand what policy what policies matter to them, to get on their, their the hill, either nationally or at their state level, to hold their lawmakers accountable and to do everything they can to make sure that they spread the message that their rights are constitutionally protected and that they can act on them. And I know I was reading an article about black, young black girls and sexual violence. I know your organization with this initiative also gives them resources on how to protect themselves if they were to come across something like that. Yeah, we, you know, that's a really tough subject matter and, and particularly on college campuses, right. um, we don't want to talk about it. And it's not that it's, you know, a huge problem, but it's a problem and that all women have to be aware of. And so one of the things that we've done is we've partnered with a technology company to help women protect themselves against intimate partner violence. But first we have to help them understand what it is. Yeah. You might be surprised that most men and women don't recognize violence when it's happening. Right. Especially so young age Especially too. young, especially those in the 18 to 25 year old age range. So we educate them on recognizing the signs of domestic violence and intimate partner violence. And then soon, in the next couple of months, we'll be rolling out some technology that will help women protect themselves um, against intimate partner violence and to help adjudicate it if it happens very quickly. So wow. it'll be clear what's going on. That's great. So you look in, is like more like an app or something like that? Or? Yeah, it's actually a piece of technology that, that women can wear. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it, really, it doesn't, it's not an app, it doesn't involve your phone. Okay. Um, but it connects you with um, a security force that will come running. Wow, well, I'm really excited to hear more about that. You guys are rocking and rolling over there at the <laughs> Health Imperative. Somebody you can wear that. That's really awesome. And how many HBCUs are you currently at right now? So we have been on five campuses. Um, we'll try to get on another 10 this year. Mm -hmm. um, and what we'd like to do is bring them all together in September for a day at the Hill um, right here in DC so that they can talk to, to policymakers get a sense of how policy actually takes place and let these policymakers know that they vote mm -hmm. and that their issues really matter. And I know your website, website also talks about unplanned um, pregnancies. We know that um, our teenage pregnancy went down among younger teens, but among the 18, 19 year old age range, I'm not sure if it's gone down as much. And it's, it's, it is an issue. Yeah, it is. We are, the unplanned pregnancy rates for black women are still far too high, mm -hmm. um, several times higher than that for white women. And there are not a number of issues, um, sort of the concentration of poverty and lack of access to quality contraception care, um, providers who are culturally competent. So we're also, we also work with providers to make sure that they understand what options are available and offer them in a non-judgmental way. Um, a lot of times 
women are feel coerced or pressured into one form or another and we need to stop that because they need they need to know they have a choice but they need the information in order to make the best choices for them right and hbc is really giving them the, the tools they said they need i went to jackson state and okay. they gave away condoms pills if you need anything i would go so i'm like i have a the flu i don't need you know i don't i don't need condoms but every no matter your arm was bleeding they gave, always gave you condoms <laughs> you know and it, it's really it's important because unintended pregnancy yes. and and, yes, and sexual true. violence are some of the leading mm -hmm. causes of college dropout. And so we mm -hmm. want you to graduate and yeah. go on and have great jobs and raise healthy families. Right, so, so they give you them. condoms if you have the flu. It is what it is, right? As long as the children are, well, I shouldn't say children, um, they're not getting pregnant. I want to move on to the Index Us. I know that's a really big initiative that's going to be released next month. And, and talk about this huge initiative and why your organization decided to take this on. It is. Um, this will be the first time ever mm -hmm. um, anyone's bothered to study healthy black women. Right, um, and, and why healthy black women, which is, you know, we'll talk about that too, because people usually tend to study the unhealthy black women. Yeah. For years and years, th those of us in the health disparity field have been studying what's wrong, what mm -hmm. makes us sick, why we're overweight, all these negative issues, and, and these things exist. But we got a chance to partner with researchers out of Boston University who are the authors of the Black Women's Health Study. And some of your listeners might even be in that study. They've got 20 years of data on 59,000 black women. Mm. And we asked them to go back and look at the women who define your health as either very good or excellent. And so what this index will do is create composites of these women by age decile, so the 30s, their 40s, their 50s, and 60s, by region, mm -hmm. so that we can understand what it is about these women that keeps them healthy. What do they do? How do they live? What do they eat? Do they exercise? What kind of stress management do they engage in? What are their issues? And our plan is to publish this report, but then take what we learn from healthy black women and apply it to our programs and messages throughout the country. Okay, looks like we have a caller. If you want to give your name or your comment, tell me your question or comment. Thank you so much for your comment. Linda, are you working with the international community here in, in the DC or around the country? We're, we're not currently, although our programs serve all women. Mm -hmm. So we, they're not limited to just American women um, or native born women. Um, historically, we have done work internationally um, in Africa, particularly around HIV and AIDS. And so um, we're actually moving into a new era for us for HIV. We've got a program called um, it's about the pre-exposure um, prophylaxis. Let's talk about PrEP. Um, okay. And what we'll be doing over the next few months is pushing out messaging and a toolkit to women to help prevent HIV. So for those women who are at higher risk for HIV, we'll make sure that we get to them and help them understand how to protect themselves and give them the tools to reduce their HIV infections because they're just far too high among black women. Right now. Yeah, it is. It's interesting because I remember maybe 10 years ago, there was a lot of talk about HIV among black women, but I feel like the conversations have died down a little bit. Maybe it's just me. No, it's not you. Um, men are still very much the focus of HIV and prevention, mm -hmm. and you don't hear about black women in that conversation. Right although black women represent sort of the fastest growing segment for HIV infection. So 
we need to get that back out in the conversation. We need to have more research into understanding why that is and make sure women understand what they can do to prevent HIV infection. Yeah, especially in the South. I think I read a study about like places like Atlanta, Memphis, they're really, um, that's where I'm from originally, Memphis, okay. Tennessee, and, and the fact that HIV is really growing a lot of Southern states, major cities. It really is. Um, you know, over 50% of new infections are happening among black women in inner cities in the South, mm -hmm. um, Atlanta being one of them. So it's really important that since we know how to prevent it, right. that we do that. Exactly. So that means giving out condoms when you go in for the flu. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> take them. Yes, take them. Exactly. I'm, yeah, don't listen to my advice. I'm like, why do I need? I was like offended, you know. Especially when you're 18, you're offended. Like, I'm, I have the flu. Why are you giving me a condom? Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. Absolutely right. You know, if it prevents disease, it's definitely mm -hmm. worth it. But we're talking about the Index Us campaign and, and really what are you hoping you would use the information for? So if, you know, if we can really understand what black women are doing to, to stay healthy, then we can spread that message and create tools for mm -hmm. all of us. Because we all can do a little something. Right. Um, and part of the reason we wanted to do it this way is because we see so much negative imagery about black women. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's always this commentary, we're to this, we're to that. We're, you know, nobody has much positive to say in the media. But the fact is, we view ourselves positively. Mm -hmm. And our hypothesis is you can learn much more from what's good than what's bad. So if we can take what we learn from these healthy black women and turn it into programs and messages, then we can help women all across the country do the little things they can do. It's not that you have to do something actually all that major. What we're finding from the study is women are doing little things like walking 20 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, taking five minutes to meditate and just calm themselves down. These are all things that we can fit into our schedules, even though we're busy. Right. But these women have figured out how to fit these health-promoting activities into their everyday schedule, and it's working for them. And so that's what we want to make sure that every woman knows. Do you see yourselves like putting together some type of maybe national type of, okay, all black women are going to do this every day, we're going to walk 20 minutes a day, or do you see yourself doing something that big with once you get this information? You know, that's that's a great idea. That might be interesting. Maybe that's something you could lead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm a walker. My, my, my mom is as well. You okay. know, we're, we're I, I'm not a runner. I, I have low blood pressure. I run and then I pass out, but I love walking. And, and you don't have to run. Right. Um, the science is very clear. Walking is really beneficial. So you don't have to be an Olympic athlete to be to be healthy. But that's a great idea. And what we hope this turns into is a national movement. Right. So that women find a way to do the things that they need to do to be healthy everywhere. Um, where they work, where they live, where they play. We can always fit in some something that helps us improve our health. Yes, I, I totally agree. So I'm talking with Linda Blount. She is the president and CEO of the Black Men's Health Imperative. If you have any questions or comments, you can call 202-580-8893. I know you have a change your lifestyle, change your life type of program. And when it comes to type 2 diabetes, that's another, unfortunately, I want to talk about the negative, but another disease that really affects black women, unfortunately. And so talk about this program. It does. Um, our Change Your Lifestyle, Change Your Life program is um, an evidence-based program. Um, from the Centers for Disease Control, and, and they have funded us to deliver this program. This is year four. Now. Okay. And what it does is it gets people in groups um, with a with a coach, a lifestyle coach, okay. who helps them understand you know, what is it about how we live and how we eat and how we exercise that can help us reduce our risk for diabetes. So the people who participate are generally pre-diabetic. So they're not quite diabetic, mm -hmm. but they're at great risk. And what our program does is it help move, helps move them back from being pre-diabetic to no longer that. So they meet in groups for 16 weeks and then meet monthly for six months. And we've seen some amazing results. Um, mm -hmm. Our program actually beats the national average by almost 100%. Wow, that's awesome. I did see some of the success mm -hmm. stories on the website. That's really great. And how, how do you find the women? I mean, how do you find about the program? Well, one of the things we do is we work with partners in mm -hmm. cities, um, Detroit, Indianapolis, um, in Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. <laughs> Mom, dad, you yep. listening? <laughs> yep. Here in D.C., L.A., right. um, who deliver the program. And mm -hmm. we train these coaches to go in and bring groups of people together in community settings, but we also offer in corporate settings because this program is actually a covered benefit by insurers. Okay. So we can offer the program in a workplace and it doesn't cost 
the employee anything, and in fact, it's covered by insurance. Wow. And so right now, our CDC grant covers paying for the program in community settings, and we intend to turn it into a model that can generate revenue so that we can help our partners make money while offering this program and saving lives. That is great. And you mentioned healthcare, so I have to bring up the Affordable Care Act. And how has that impacted Black women's health? Well, the, the great thing is we have more and more black women who have enrolled in health insurance. Okay. So this is huge. Um, it has made a, an enormous difference and, it, and will continue to make an enormous difference. We won't see the impact on mortality for a few years, mm -hmm. but the fact that women and their families are insured where they haven't been is hugely important. And, and I'll just mention that we're partnering with the Office of Women's Health. Okay. There'll be a Twitter chat next Tuesday from one to two, so your listeners can kind of tune in to Twitter and hear about issues around ACA and how well it's, it's working. But one of the things I'll, I'll mention is, you know, there's been this controversy recently about the change in mammography screening mm -hmm. guidelines. Well, mammography is a covered benefit mm -hmm. under ACA, it, and it doesn't cost women anything to have a screening mammogram. If these guidelines actually take, well, they're in effect, but if insurance companies choose to change their policies, then we can have a whole, we could have millions of women suddenly lose access to screening mammography, and then we're sort of back to where we were. Right. Um, and since we black women, again, not to focus on the negative, but our more bre breast cancer mortality rates are 40% higher, yes. the last thing we need is to not get screened. Right. We get breast cancer younger, so we need to make sure that we get screened starting at 40, and, and it needs to be a covered benefit, because if we have to pay for it out of pocket, then that gives us an excuse not to do it. There are so many discrepancies about having a particular screening done. And it's kind of frustrating for women to figure out, okay, so should I, should I, should I wait to 40, should I wait to 45? And I know, I think I was hearing 45, but for like I said, for black women, it should be 40. We really think so. Um, the, the Preventive Services Task Force raised the age to 50, mm -hmm. the American Cancer Society raised the age to 45. They're all looking at the science. I mean, these are all people who are looking at the data and, and, and absolutely understand it. But the, the thing that we don't know is what exactly is happening with black women. Mm -hmm. Our incidence rates used to be lower. Now they've, they've increased, so we have the same incidence rate overall for breast cancer as white women. We have a very different lived experience, there's right. stress. So this plays a role in disease expression. So all we were saying um, was let's not rush to change these guidelines just yet. Let's try to understand some more about the studies, look at more recent studies, look at the lived experiences of black women and try to understand when they really should start screening before we raise the age. Right, or having screenings for different and races. I know that sounds crazy, but for instance, when you talk about colon cancer, I think they do suggest that black men or black people get uh, colon cancer screenings earlier than, than white people. So I see the same thing for breast cancer. Yeah. There, there are differences. You know, differences perhaps not so much around, along racial lines, but certainly along ethnicity. Right. Because our ethnicity, our heritage, actually mm -hmm. impacts the way we react to certain drugs. Right. So we have to be very careful um, before we make sort of blanket judgments and apply blanket policies. And what else are you working on? I mentioned quite a few things. I actually didn't get a chance to get to everything. Like I the Grab Your Girls and Gold program. If you have like 30 seconds, we want to talk about that. But what else are you working on? Because you, you, you're working on so many great initiatives. Yeah, we spent a lot of work, uh, a lot of time on policy. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned mammography. We've got to prevent, you know, we're preventing. Um, we want to have, make sure we have access to screening. The Violence Against Women Act, the Each Woman Act, which um, you know, supports our constitutional right to mm -hmm. uh, contraception care and abortion care and making sure that women who get federally funded insurance can have access to abortion care. Um, we spend a lot of time working on implementing our programs through partners across the country. We have taken an approach where we're investing in partners to make sure that they do their best work and we empower them. So it's really exciting. We've got some great yes, stuff coming up. Too. And you know, I invite your listeners to go to our website at bwhi.org, follow us on Twitter at Black Women's Health. Hopefully they can make the Twitter chat next week and just stay tuned and listen to your show. Yeah. You're doing really great work. Oh, thank you. Thank, no, th thank you. I, I, like I said, this is important for, as a black woman, uh, it's a really important topic for me on this show. And I really feel like, you know, in order for us, our community to get better, we definitely as black women, we need to be healthy. So I, I think right. it's a very important topic to talk about. So again, name the website one more time before. It's bwhi.org. 
Thank you. So you just heard from Linda Blount. She is president and CEO of the Black Women's Health Imperative. If you missed any information on my show, you can always go to my website, empowermagazine.com slash empower hour. The last word today comes from Rebecca Lee Crumpler. She was the first African-American woman to become a physician in the U.S. And she said, I early received a liking for it and sought every opportunity to relieve the suffering of others. So until next week, stay empowered. Thank you. 20 plus minutes, it goes by just like that. <laughs> it really does. Yeah, but it was great. You know, I'm really glad to have you on. Oh, Thank you. Oh, I've got the, um, the, I just want to do an ending for for your periscope as I, you know, go to my, my So we're both kind of in the that uh, winter. Yeah, you know, I took some allergy. And- I took some allergy medication this morning, and I don't know why I'm just having sniffles yeah, it's, all it's year. Yeah, especially this weather is crazy. So it was like super cold yesterday, and it snowed for like two seconds right, last night. Right. And now it's almost 50 degrees right. outside. I have like a coat that's too big. But, exactly. but I really appreciate you coming. Well, you, you look so beautiful. Oh, thank you. You're so with your blue and your hair. So well, it's so, so nice. So thank you thank so you. much for thank coming. Thank you for doing this. You know, I mean, it, I, I wish, you know, we could have more of you doing this to, mm-hmm. you know, get the word out. Right. Um, because so few of us really understand that we can do something. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes we get the sense of, oh, there's nothing I can do. Right. And we see it all around us, mm-hmm. and it's easy to give up. But as long as we have you, kind of keep, just keep reminding us, yep, there's something you can do. Yeah, I mean, there's and that's why I do this show, and not to be like a separatist, but I really focus on black issues. Because, unfortunately, when people talk about when, you know, white, the white community has a cold, you know, it's not the flu. We have pneumonia. Yeah. We're yeah. on a life support breathing machine. Right. And so right. it's it's really, really... Um, someone has, someone has a question for her, for me, for me, okay, (laughs) um, okay, I'll be right back. Okay. Okay.